Here we are back for another week of Ideas in Progress from IHS. I'm your host, Anthony Comegna, and Professor Brad Berzer joins us once again. Last week, we talked Federalists and Anti-Federalists, but this week, we'll take that story forward a generation or two. We're wrestling with old hickory, tackling Berzer's recent book, In Defense of Andrew Jackson. All right, so Brad, I'd like to pick up uh, right where we left off last week, and you were, you were talking about uh, historian Bruce Fronin and his argument that the sort of founders or the framers, I should say, the framers generation was really the last one where a sort of non-ideological politics marked American life and that after that it's sort of this knockdown, drag out fight to tar uh, your enemies as the people who are destroying the republic and uh, betraying everything the revolutionaries fought for and it's just this nasty knockdown drag out fight all the time that maybe gets worse and worse every four years. Um, but you know the the nonetheless the way you were sort of describing the situation of you know politicians being able to have their day of arguing ideas in in the convention hall in Philadelphia and then they go and they share a bottle of Madeira at night and sort of uh, chit chat and hang out that it <laughs> as a cultural historian of Jacksonian America you'll appreciate maybe how much that sounds familiar to a short story by Herman Melville, The Paradise of Bachelors, Tartarus of Maids, uh, where all these English lawyers uh, enjoy these tremendously lavish, expensive, luxurious meals um, while, uh, of course, the working classes toil along in sort of uh, endless drudgery, wasting themselves away. And it, things work out very well for the gentlemen, but not so well for everybody else. Um, and, you know, it seems to me that uh, there still was this kind of uh, a somewhat pleasant gentleman's agreement type atmosphere uh, leading up into the Jacksonian period. And I'm wondering, you know, how different really were the political situations under, say, Andrew Jackson uh, compared to, say, George Washington? Yeah, that's well put, Anthony. And and I'm not. I wouldn't disagree with you or the intent of the question. I you know one of the the most interesting things, and I think one of the the fatal aspects of the Constitution is that even though when the Constitution was created, in general there was a limitation on the sphere of politics, the Constitution in many ways disrupts that limitation in that sphere, and by you know proclaiming that through this balance of powers we'll keep things limited, I think the founders royally messed up. And what we find, of course, throughout the entire Jacksonian period is that politics becomes something that becomes so widespread that you also then spread what politics can intrude into as well. I mean, this is one of the greatest dangers, I think, of democracy. You know, it, in some sense, when you do have these elites, and you know, not necessarily Melville's portray portrayal of them, but when you do have elites who can kind of just you know, keep each other busy and occupied, but they're not allowed to interfere with the lives of the ordinary people, that that's not a bad situation. It, it strikes me as one kind of familiar, or at least similar to the things that you know, St. Augustine would argue, you're always going to have evil in the world. You want to keep that evil as limited as possible and in its own sphere and not allow it to spread into the sphere of, of other things. And I wonder if there's a same argument that could be made that the Constitution broke down in America over time, that separation of politics and everything else and allowed all to become political. Uh, you know, I certainly as much as I as, as Many things as there are in the Constitution I like, I think there are great dangers in it as well because it does allow for that politicization of society. You know, that, your, your uh, comment there makes me think of yet another reason why I sort of uh, tend to treat Martin Van Buren as one of the, the shadow <laughs> villains of this period, much as a lot of classical liberals tend to like him. Right. Uh, I think right. he's, he's just such a pernicious influence behind the scenes. I mean, when when he's in the New York legislature in the early 1820s, he's like specifically arguing to all of his lieutenants in state politics. Okay, we need to pivot away from opposition to universal male suffrage and and start courting that vote because it's gonna happen one way or the other, and it's just a matter of which political faction gets ahead of it and gets to capitalize on those new votes the most. And so he does this 180 degree pivot towards supporting uh, 
universal male suffrage in New York. And, uh, you know, it's just totally this cynical move um, to oh, gain yeah. votes. And, it, I mean, it seems like that is really what characterizes these new politics. Yeah, you know, I, that reminds me, Anthony, and I, I can't remember the exact words that he used, but Andrew Jackson had a pet name, and it wasn't Little Magician. He had a pet name like Little Machiavelli, <laughs> something <laughs> like that, for Van Buren. And uh, I can't, I, yeah, I'll have to look that up, because now I, I remember just laughing so hard when I read it for the first time. <laughs> but it was something to the effect of, you know, it, Martin Van Buren has his purposes, but you would never want to ask him on anything dealing with first. <laughs> something to that ex- to that effect. Now, you of course have a recent book out, or fairly recent still, about Andrew Jackson. Um, and one thing I want to know about Jackson is: was he a Federalist, or to what degree, to what extent, in his context, what does that word even mean anymore? You know, when he was a younger man, uh, he always identified with the old Republicans, with people like John Randolph of Roanoke and John Taylor of Caroline and uh, Mason. I mean, these were the people that he really identified with. And one of the the greatest conflicts of, of conscience that he ever had in his life was when he went against nullification in South Carolina and really could not decide if he had been correct or not about that, really did have a struggle. And I think ultimately, though, what we see with someone like Andrew Jackson, he's not a federalist, but he is at some level a unionist. And I think that's related to the federalist, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. I think uh, partly this was an evolving thing for him, but I also think there was a lot of ego involved, especially when he was president at that time. And he had such a personal hatred for John C. Calhoun that I, I think a lot of it had to do with that personal conflict as much as it did have to do with ideals. Is it fair to say that Jackson was a nationalist? I don't think he was. I really do think the best description for him is a unionist. I I think there on certain issues, he believes very strongly in national authority, but on others, not at all. It seems pretty clear to me that with economics, he believed very strongly in localism and states' rights and free enterprise, uh, kind of a mixture of all three. But when it did come to things like nullification, he he was definitely uh, a nationalist. But it's also worth remembering, he never, ever, even when he was in it. He never respected the standing army. Uh, Throughout his whole life, he was leery of a standing army and always saw that as a great threat to the possibility of of union. And he thought it would lead to disunion because of the concentration of power within the military. So in that sense, he doesn't sound at all like either the Federalists or, say, our modern day neocons. I think he really is something that doesn't quite exist anymore. Why do you think Jackson was so... Uh, I don't know if I want to use the word afraid for anything related to Jackson, but uh, (laughs) why do you think he was so worried about the possibility of disunion? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And on some things he didn't mind. I think he thought a little disunion was healthy from time to time. But on other issues, especially when it came to national authority in the Constitution, he was pretty particular, especially when he was president. Uh, again, I think there is a lot of ego involved. I think there's a lot of personality. You know, Jackson was not one for subtlety at all. And especially when it came to relations with him, you were either totally with him or totally against him. Calhoun, he had thought had was totally with him and then realized, came to realize slowly and then very suddenly that Calhoun had always been against him. And that was a, that was one of those things that I don't think Jackson was able to get over at all. And I'm not sure he was constitutionally, and I don't mean the U.S. Constitution, I mean <laughs> mentally, psychologically. I'm not sure he was capable of uh, being able to forgive his enemies, uh, that that was just not part of his makeup at all. But there is a there's a strong kind of interesting individualism in Jackson, not just in his policies, but in who he was as a person. But there's also, I think, the danger of that individualism is there is kind of an authoritarianism, at least in personal relationships, where he does expect you to conform to his wishes and believe what he believed. You know, that point about Jackson perhaps being constitutionally incapable of forgiveness, which I love, um, it makes me wonder how how real do you think or how seriously should we take the rhetoric of the time uh, surrounding like the the 
threat that Great Britain posed still to American independence or the threat of war with Great Britain. You know, was because Jackson, you know, famously said he didn't want to annex uh, Texas because he didn't want a war with Mexico and people didn't want to antagonize Great Britain by, you know, uh, sp sparking up conflicts over Canada or by taking any new territory. Um, and I, I'm wondering, though, is a lot of Jackson's uh, uh, support for the Union, is it built out of a sort of fear that we still need to protect ourselves from some foreign threat, especially the British Empire? You know, he, he absolutely hated the British Empire. Uh, that, of course, goes back to his childhood when he was 12 and 13 and fighting as a young boy in the American Revolution and having that British, British officer basically ground his skull in um, when he was you know, that young. And I'm sure Jackson was being obnoxious, <laughs> but that doesn't mean he deserved that kind of treatment, of course. Uh, Jackson never, ever forgave the British for that. And, of course, as we just talked about, he's not really capable of forgiveness overall. I think, you know, what's interesting to me and what I found in the book, and my guess is you know this period better than I do, Anthony, on this issue especially, but when you look back at Jackson, part of his getting involved in the War of 1812 was his hatred of England. It was also his love of America. But you see that the relations with the, Brit with the British during his presidency are really odd relations. He doesn't want to get involved with them, but that also means he doesn't want to get involved with them. He really doesn't pursue peace or war during his presidency with Britain. Um, you know, that, and that's interesting to me. And I, and I also found this isn't quite directly to the question you just asked, but I was also really surprised in my own research going through British papers, how much the British both feared and respected Jackson. And I think all of that comes out of what happened at the Battle of New Orleans. Go ahead, tell us more. Oh, you know, so you've got this, I mean, where the British, of course, had an overwhelming force. They had roughly 10,000 men and, uh, we have Jackson with only about 2,000. And of course, Jackson was able to get emplacements and build ditches and get everything, you know, kind of things that we would call modern trench warfare. He was able to get all that in place so that when the British finally did attack, even though they had you know, just legions of soldiers who had all fought in the Napoleonic Wars and were battle hardened, you know, the assault by Ned Packenham on New Orleans was just such a disaster that Jackson was able to just mutilate that British army, including the commanders, the three leading officers, uh, you to take out the, to take them out so quickly that it's very strange. And the British really did kind of go from thinking of us as a third to fourth rate power ready to fall apart to being something to be respected. I, I think that's one of the great kind of miracles, quote unquote, of the Battle of New Orleans and what it led to. It actually kind of led to good relations with the British, which is uh, only in international relations could this happen, <laughs> where your destruction of your enemy causes them to like you. Uh, you know, but pretty amazing, nonetheless. Well, you know, that's that's why I asked the question about how seriously we should take this this threat from the British Empire that supposedly lingers after the War of 1812. Um, to where you you know you see politicians like Daniel Webster sort of scrambling to make concessions on the one hand, and yet there's always also this just deep cultural hatred of everything British yeah. that lingers in places like the frontier on and on and on. And they just look at Queen Victoria as, you know, the worst oh. person in the world. And maybe she was uh, sitting atop, you know, the, the bones of countless Indians. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I find it extremely far fetched that the, the British posed any real threat to the United States anymore. Uh, yeah, I think the, the only way they could have is if they had really gotten a foothold either into the Pacific Northwest beyond just the Hudson Bay Company or into Texas. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would agree with you, Anthony. I think, you know, and you can imagine, uh, I, you know, think about the Civil War, you know, whatever we think of the Civil War itself. Imagine at the end of that war where Ulysses S. Grant has roughly two million men in arms. At, you know, in May of 1865, I, there's nobody in the world that could have challenged us at that point. Um, nobody even close. So, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, overall, I think you're absolutely right.
Now, uh, your book, of course, you bill it as a defense of uh, Andrew Jackson. I'm wondering, can you go ahead and fill out? You've mentioned certainly some things that I, I think uh, people might find admirable so far. His his skill, certainly, and uh, probably a lot of his I- idealism or his ideals. Um, but go ahead and sketch out a bit more your particular defense sure. for us. Yeah, thanks for asking. So, you know, I when I went into that book, that that book... I, I can honestly say was uh, was the result of just being asked by the publisher to write it, and I it was a lot because of Trump's. I mean, not a lot, probably a hundred percent because of Trump's interest in Jackson at that point. And Regnery was looking for somebody to write that book, and I was contacted by my friend John Miller, who's both at Hillsdale as well as National Review, because he was good friends with the publisher and editor at. Regnery at that point. And I was pretty skeptical uh, that I could write anything that was favorable. I've been teaching Jacksonian America as a distinct course at Hillsdale College for 20 years now. And for the vast majority of that time, really for about 17 to 18 years of that time, I always taught Jackson as the bad guy, as someone who distorted the Constitution, who put way too much power into the executive branch. So I'm sure I have a number of students uh, that probably are scratching their heads wondering what happened to Berzer. Did he lose it? Uh, Because he's now defending uh, Andrew Jackson. But what I what I came to find, and I had made an agreement with Regnery that basically, you know, as long as I present the case, both good and bad for Jackson, uh, that we can, you know, the book will go forward. And I said, I've just got to be critical about his Indian policy and so forth. And I still am. I mean, I think there are things to put it into context and to understand it. There's very little to defend it, um, only to understand it, I think. But yeah, there are a lot of things I think Jackson did wrong, but what I found, and I, I did write that book really quickly. I, I think I had mentioned to you over dinner, Anthony, that I had the contract signed on May 1st and I had the book finished August 4th. So, you know, this was all within that one single, you know, four month period I wrote that book. And I couldn't have done it without having taught Jacksonian America for so many years. But as I started, the first thing I did, I ordered the 10 volumes of Andrew Jackson's papers and I started reading and I'm a fast reader and I started reading his letters and I just could not believe how honest he was. And, you know, I've had a chance to go through the papers of James Buchanan, uh, the president, not the economist, the president. And you can just see immediately where the guy's lying. Um, It's just very clear where he's being duplicitous and he's nasty. And I thought, what a breath of fresh air that Jackson, whether I agree with him or not, just says what he believes. And, you know, I know people criticize him for his duels, but I found that in every one of those duels, you know, I don't agree with his code of honor, but there was always a code of honor. He was totally honest. Now he may blow you away after he's honest, um, but he was totally honest. And whatever his faults, I still think honesty is a virtue. And I was impressed by that. So I came, I felt that one of the great things about Jackson was that anyone, myself or anyone else, could come to know him and actually know him, not as someone like Van Buren, who you have to read between the lines and look at what's going on and see what he's doing that's duplicitous. But Jackson just tells you, if you're if you're someone he hates, you know it. If you're someone he loves, you know it. If he thinks you're right on most things, but wrong on another thing, he tells you. And he was actually quite honest about his own failings as well. And I, I found that really refreshing. So, you know, I'm typically, I, I'm a typical libertarian. I almost, I think automatically politician scum. And, uh, you know, I expected that when I went into him as well, especially because I disagree with so many of his policies. But when I started reading him, I found it very hard not to be attracted to him because of that honesty. Now, two other things uh, I found really, really interesting about some of your choices in this biography. Um, sure. Historiographically, I think it's it's important that you focus on Jackson as a Westerner um, because so much of the literature on Jackson in the last couple of generations has, has been on Jackson, the Southern planter. But, you know, as, right. as you point out, the the fact of his, his growing up and operating so frequently on the frontier and in that culture uh, is really, really important to shaping who he is. And then the other thing that I find really compelling here is that you make a conscious choice 
to focus on what you call the man in full as opposed to the man in detail. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about that choice to, to write about the man in full and then about Jackson the Westerner as opposed to Jackson the Southerner. Yeah, yeah, great questions, Anthony. Thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start with that that question about man in full. Uh, that that of course comes from Tom Wolfe and the idea of trying to look at a person as a complete person, not just taking the good or the bad, but really in kind of a very stoic fashion, understanding within justice, so past, present, future, up, down, transcendent, what what might be mundane, trying to figure out, yeah. You know, there's probably a Catholic element in there as well, but trying to figure out where the human person fits in. And in that sense, I was very taken with Jackson's mother, who was such an influence on him and his wife, too. You, One of the things I think we often forget is that Jackson's wife, though politically not able to vote and not able to carry the same kind of weight because she was a woman, uh, was really his partner in everything. And once she was gone, he was diminished. And of course, that means his whole presidency. So I don't think he is actually a man in full after she passes away. This is how close they were, how much she revered him, you know, almost to an unnatural degree. And I don't mean that in the sense there was perversion, not that, but it, his love of his mother and his wife were so intense that it seems almost supernatural rather than natural. And in fact, the only way, and again, I bring this up as a Catholic, but the only way I could make sense of his love of his mother and his wife beyond just what was normal was he really kind of thinks of them, I think, in the way that a super devout Roman Catholic would think of the Virgin Mary, that kind of just awe, or the way maybe King Arthur thought of the Lady of the Lake, you know, just that that mythical awe that he had of women. And it wasn't just white women. Um, you know, he also treated his uh, those slaves, um, and, and, and they're slaves, right? <laughs> so wild. But he also treated the female slaves, as far as we know, with intense respect. And even, you know, there, I have a story in there about how he treated prostitutes well. And I, you know, none of that's Southern. It's all very, very Western. So if that leads into the second part of your question, Anthony, you know, the thing I found over and over again, and, and part of my own training is in Western America and Western America during the American Revolution, especially, but that frontier ethos was, and especially the Scotch-Irish frontier ethos, just permeated Jackson in all of his language and all of his actions. He never thought of himself as a Southerner. He always thought of himself as a frontiersman. And there really is, I think, in American history, a kind of Natty Bumpo, Daniel Boone kind of figure uh, later on in the 20th century. I think in terms of Hollywood, it would be you know people like uh, uh, John Wayne, and then maybe to a more cynical degree, Clint Eastwood. But there's an element in that kind of American type that I think we all recognize as this kind of heroic individual who always has a dark side. You know, that there's that violent, almost unremittingly violent side. But they try and overcome it through their nobility and especially in their chivalry. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who would say that what Jackson had in his relationship, especially towards his wife, was a form of sexism. I didn't see it that way. I thought it was really very medieval and Scotch-Irish, but always rooted in that the kind of pristine notion of the frontier. Was Andrew Jackson a racist? Well, I mean, yes and no, uh, in the sense that he harmed people who were not white, yes, um, and owning slaves, yes. Looking at the way he actually talked about humans, not really. Um, you know, he had an Indian son that he had adopted, which I suppose in a certain argument be called, could be called racist as a kind of white superiority, but he didn't really treat his son that way from what I could read. You know, he left one of his black slaves, a female, in charge whenever he was gone. And after Rachel had died, his wife had died. Um, and he had great respect. And they at least seem to have had great respect for him. I mean, our evidence seems to indicate that his understanding of others was rooted totally in whether he liked them or not. And that seemed to have transcended both skin color as well as gender. Uh, it really 
really was personal. Are you with Jackson or are you against him? And if you're with him, it doesn't matter what you look like or what your sex organs are. You know, you're a part of this. And um, if you don't like him, then the same thing is true. It doesn't matter what color you are or what your gender is. You know, you're nothing. And that was my take on him. I'm, I'm sure skin color played a role. I mean, he's a man of the, of the 19th century, but I didn't see it blatantly in the way that I've seen it in other figures of that day. Well, you know, again, I think that's why this this uh, Westerner angle is so important here, that, you know, these are the kinds of things that distinguish, say, your Western frontier paternalist from a deep south cotton belt uh, yes. racist, yes. you know? Well, extremely well put and, i think the frontier demanded you know <laughs> yeah when you get out on the frontier you can't be picky if you need to fight you, you give your wife the gun you know i mean if you've got a plow you give your wife the plow <laughs> i mean i think there's a reason that western states allowed the vote for women earlier than eastern states um you know it's just the frontier experience in many ways erases both race and gender it has to or you're or you're dead now, you didn't get to spend much time on Jackson the president. Of course, that, that's part of your original decision to focus on the man in full rather than the man in detail. Uh, but if there was anything from his presidency that you could have spent a significant amount of time on, what would it have been? Yeah, Anthony, you know, I haven't admitted this before, but a lot of that was simply because I ran out of time <laughs> and I had to get my manuscript in. Um, you know, and I, I think if I'd had more time, I probably would have dealt more with his presidency. As it turns out, Regnery still cut out about a third of the book. I had a lot more on the mythological aspect of Jackson that Regnery took out. And I would have liked to have spent more time on his presidency. I will say, um, maybe, and this may be a little bit of self-justification, I did not find his presidency as interesting as his pre-presidential life. And I think in large part is because he didn't have Rachel. And you start actually getting into kind of soap opera drama in his relations with Van Buren and his relations with his cabinet members and in ways that I think his wife would have straightened him out on, if that makes sense. I think she would have made clear what certain relationships were. It's kind of part of what he relied on her for. They truly were a team in that. But I think if I had dealt more with the presidency, you know, and maybe someday I'll come back to that because there's still a lot to do. But I think if I dealt more with the presidency, I would have dealt a lot more with his foreign policy because he's such a domestically oriented president, especially with the bank wars and the Indian uh uh, the Indian uh, removal policy, all of that. But I think there are the questions you brought up earlier. You know, what about his relations with Mexico? What about with Texas? What about with Britain? What about with France? You know, those, those are incredible questions that no scholarship has really tackled. And I think there's a lot to do there. Uh, and I think even though Jackson didn't put his emphasis on those things, that in and of itself makes an interesting story. Why didn't he? Why was he so secure on certain things but not others? And I'd love to see, you know, just going back and looking at maybe uh, some of the papers from the Secretary of War and the Secretary of State, I'd like to see what he was thinking about the Monroe Doctrine. I, I think there are probably a lot of things that would be very interesting. And I, you know, I, in a sense, I apologize for not having done that. Um, I think that probably is a, a, a flaw in the book, rather serious flaw, frankly. Do you think Jackson is uh, out there somewhere looking admiringly on the current administration? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, and I, I say this, I'm, I, you know, I don't want to get too moralistic here, but, you know, when it comes to Trump and his relations, Jackson is exactly the opposite. Uh, you know, Jackson, Jackson was killing people for uh, saying derogatory things about his wife and his mother. Um, and I, I don't see I don't see that in Trump. <laughs> I think Trump makes jokes about it on Entertainment Tonight. So. Yeah. <laughs> but forgive me for getting moralistic. No, I don't think they're alike at all. Once again, our warmest thanks to Professor Berzer for joining us. I know I get a little heated about this stuff. Jacksonian America is my bread and butter after all. But Brad has that cool demeanor that's just perfect for a discussion leader. Next week, we check in with a very different sort of program. It's Grad School 101 here on Ideas in Progress. <laughs>